100 days as a nuclear engineer in a nuclear craft fallout bunker vault. The surface is no longer safe and we won't be able to go above ground for the next 100 days. So our mission will be to quickly build an underground bunker with enough food, power, and safety measures to keep us safe from the radiation on the surface and the radiation from our reactors. But on the start of this beautiful day, I have none of those worries on my mind. I'm headed to class because I'm about to graduate and officially start my life as a nuclear engineer. I want to spend my life showing everyone that nuclear science is something that shouldn't be feared. And in fact, it can save the world from pollution. And There's a nuclear explosion right behind me, isn't there? You know what? On uh, second thought, instead of walking, uh, I think I'll take the subway. The nuclear explosion means that we cannot go up to the surface for the entire playthrough. We're underground for the rest of this video. So the question is, can I make this work? Can you survive in Minecraft for 100 days without going to the surface? And if I want to make it through the next 100 days, I'll need to take advantage of the sewer systems down under the city. I can see from the subway, that there's some big caves down deeper. So I go from being a subway homeless guy to a sewer homeless guy. Big upgrades. In the sewers, I find a brown log and uh, I really hope this is an edible root because I'm hungry. Unlike my lunch, my luck is not going to be going down the toilet because I come across this crystal cave full of gold, emeralds, and yes, these diamonds. Even with all the great stuff, I'm a little more interested in the broken mine shaft. One of the big problems with being stuck underground is getting wood, so this mine shaft might just save us. All things considered, this is a pretty good start to our bunker life. This start is pretty great, but you know what's even greater? Or what's more great? What's the greatest thing of all is you guys. Thank you guys for watching this video, and thank you so much for welcoming me back with so much love. Now, I'm not going to get too mushy this time, but I just had to stop right away and say thanks for everything you guys have been doing. I'm super lucky to have this community. Now, what's not so lucky are the villagers who ended up in this little vault experiment. I guess Vault Tech designed this one to test to see what happens when you expose villagers to the sewers for too long. In all due seriousness, these pre-made mini little dungeons are super important because they're going to give us loot that we normally would not be able to get in vanilla caves, like this chest in this massive mine shaft. We got some seeds in here, which are going to be good for our bunker farm. And ooh, some super stylish pants. The engineer's pants are quite fitting. <laughs> now that's a good pun. I'm being rewarded with my amazing sense of humor with some amazing day one loot, like tons of iron blocks and beetroot seeds too. I know, I know, normally beetroots suck, but this time they're gonna come and clench big time. You'll see. I head back to my furnace and crafting table and I make a chest to store up all this good loot. But it's not at all upside. A lot of these big caves have some pitfalls and some of them like this are filled with a ton of lava. On top of that, the caves are crawling with pre-made structures like this underground dungeon full of mob spawners and yeah, we are not ready to take this on yet. Oh look, a little trap door. Maybe this will be a good place to start our little bunker. Oh, not a good spot, not a good spot, not a good spot. I mean, come on. If I'm saying it's gonna be a good spot, you guys should have already seen this coming. I have to pull the old bury myself trick and eat these brown logs, so I'm literally eating But in fairness, probably should have known that the caves would have some really great stuff along with some really horrible stuff. Craft up some armor to keep me a little bit safer. And then I look at my weirdly discolored skin. I think I've already started to mutate on day one. I'm not wasting any time getting started on our bunker. And I quickly dig out a safe little spot to hide our base. Then we use our iron tools to immediately harvest some diamonds and emeralds. And on day one, we've already got a diamond pick and a sword. Day two, and it's time to keep the great start going. We grab some wood for more chests, and I start to collect some dirt so we can get some food instead of just these stinky brown logs. I love my farming, but I just spent 100 days making a harvest craft video, so 
I'll try to control myself and keep it to just bare bones this time. I start to grab some string from the spider webs because there's no sheep for wool down here. And soon I find another vault tech disaster. This time I'm feeling a little more brave, so I carefully try to loot it since I have been leveling my lockpick and sneak so much. Finally, we get home and I craft up a bed. I set it down, but I'm gonna be real with you guys. I don't know when it's day or when it's night down here, so I actually very rarely sleep throughout this entire playthrough. Which is good, because it gives me time to find this orange crystal cave. Hmm, is that water down there? Oh, I sure hope so, because here we go. Hmm, well, that was good. Anyway, I've already started to notice that there's a lot of lower areas deep under the city that have some of the biggest chambers I've ever seen. And I'm starting to figure out that different Y coordinates have different stuff as you go down. Speaking of different stuff, Nuclear Craft has a ton of new ores, such as this thorium vein, which is the real nuclear future of humanity, in my opinion. And of course, uranium, the scary one. We get back home on day three, and I set up my first infinite water source, right next to the farm, and then we add a little bit of water for the crops. We start to cook up some ores, but we're definitely gonna need a much better system than this. For now, let's get back to the crops. I make a market with some of the emeralds and spider webs that I've been collecting. And we're gonna need to focus on getting some of the highest yield crops for the sake of survival. And yes, I hate to say this, but we have to buy soybeans. I know, I know, they're not my favorite food either, but this will let us make tofu and soy milk so we can get a ton of better food options. And speaking of survival foods, we get some rice. And then I decide to treat myself and I grab this spruce tree. Honestly, I could probably manage to survive on just the mineshaft wood, but come on, I like spruce. Then we get a chicken egg because you can't make soy eggs. Oh, well, technically, yes, you can, but ew. Then some corn and onions, which are super versatile crops. Then we start planting, but remember, we only have one seed of each, so um, this is it. This is gonna be our start. I make another little half farm over here and I place the onion and even though this is only day two, it's already starting to look pretty good. Still gonna have to be eating those turds though. We get a small little area for the chickens, which are the best survival animals, because remember, they make eggs, so you don't have to get two of them to breed them. Then we throw down the spruce tree. This single furnace, it's taking forever. So we grab ourselves a second one really quick, but the furnace setup is gonna be the first industrial upgrade we get for sure. We start day four out, by running out and doing a good amount of mining because the furnaces and the farms are going to be busy smelting and growing for a bit. I'm going to be 100% honest with you guys, this playthrough has a ton of mining in it, but also a ton of surprises, like this little vault dweller right here that didn't get unalived yet. It is at least a little nice to know that I'm not alone down here. And he even has a few little trades to do too. I think I'm going to name Mute Indiana Jones. Admittedly, not as good looking as Harrison Ford, but he'll do. And speaking of good looking, just look at this cave, how many ores there are in it. Nuclear craft really makes mining fun and exciting, but I am gonna edit out most of the grinding and mining, of course. Trust me, there's a ton of other stuff that we're gonna have to get to. I know this video is almost two hours long, but I couldn't cut out any of the craziness. Speaking of which, let's get started on that tomorrow. After our very first sleep since the bombs fell, we start to get into the nuclear element as we now have enough thorium to make a thorium block. And we'll be using this by making some decay generators, which is the very first step in nuclear craft, if you don't have any other sort of RF generating mods. While digging back, I run into this open sewer branch, but I decide I could easily do some quick patchwork around here and make this a good little starting lab to set up all of our radioactive machines. If it could hold some poop, it can hold some glowing rocks. DGs slowly absorb the natural radiation given off from the decaying block of uranium and thorium and produce a little bit of RF. We then get the DGs down, but honestly, don't do this. This is a really inefficient way to set them up and I'm actually gonna fix them real soon. First, we need to get a few more of those angry rocks. So we make a few more blocks of uranium and thorium. We set those here so that they're each touching the DGs. But I can hear my stomach growling, so I'm gonna run out and try to get some food. Sadly, nothing is growing yet, so I'm gonna need to break out a little bit of my bone meal. I get the spruce tree up, but chop this thing down and there's no saplings. So we're back to the mineshaft wood. But the actual crops are coming along really well. And that is, after all, a little more important. Okay, let's get back to the nuclear craft. The first machine you need is a manufacturing 
you already know how much I love me a strong man. A manufactory is made out of a piston, some redstone, cobble, a little flint, and some lead and copper. And lead and copper are just some nuclear craft ores that are added. And yes, this was copper added in before Mojang did it. So, I mean, I'm kind of a trendsetter. You know, no big deal. We get everything ready, and in fact make two manufactories because they are just that important. We need them to make graphite dust. This is a big part of a lot of nuclear craft machines. But for me, the real thing here that makes me happy is now we can double our ore production. Of course, they can only do all of these wonderful things if they have power and, wow, I really do not have any power. I'm gonna rearrange the uranium so that as many surfaces of the DG are touching radioactive sources. By doing this, they'll be giving us the highest amount of angry juice possible. Yes, that is what I'm gonna be calling RF for the rest of my life. Which leads me to this big open cave down here. Take notes, it's gonna be important later. Sure enough, we do get our copper dust. Now you'll notice each ore turns into two copper dust, and for each one dust turns into one ingot. Therefore, one ore equals two ingots. You, you get the math, right? You understand what I'm saying? I hope so, because I'm gonna be honest, if that confuses you, it's gonna get so much worse. Just hang in there. Okay, so now we have two decently powered mans. But what's next? Well, the next step in nuclear craft is usually the alloy furnace, which definitely does not work like a normal furnace. You'll see. First, we need to make basic panels to make that. In basic panels, you need graphite dust. See how this is all working? Graphite dust needs to have coal run through the manufactory twice. You add a bit of lead and a bit of graphite dust to get basic panels. Easy. Then you just add some brick, a normal furnace. Yeah, this is a pretty basic machine. Now we head back down into the lab and set it on the power strip and, ooh, ooh, where can I put this to get the most power possible? Okay, well obviously this was the wrong answer. The first thing we're gonna try to make is combining our iron and our graphite dust. But judging by the power supply, this might take a little while. Which means this is the perfect time to go and grab some more coal. And we get back to the base on day six, and I have an inventory full of ores. Hmm, maybe too many. I'm definitely gonna get working on a hopper system. But for right now, we're gonna be making some glass. Now you're probably wondering, can you even find sand in caves? Well, another great thing that manufacturers do is that they will turn cobblestone into sand. So now, we don't even need to worry about finding a desert or going to the surface. We can produce our own sand. Like I said, this alloy furnace doesn't smell things like a normal furnace would. For that, we're going to have to make a redstone furnace, which I'm going to get started on right now. You'll probably notice right away that the recipe for this is really weird. This is because it's a thermal expansion item. It takes a little bit of different stuff like copper gears, a reception coil, uh, that's just the gold redstone-y thing. Anyway, after this, we just add some bricks, some of that glass, and boom. Now, in my opinion, if you have a manufactory slash redstone furnace combo, it is a huge boost to your mining production. You can double your ores and then smelt them without using any coal. Even if you're not gonna be crazy like me and make a molten salt reactor or some nuclear weapons, this alone is a great boost and is kind of a great reason to play nuclear craft all by itself. However, we do want to get a molten salt reactor and nukes, so we still have quite a ways to go. But my excitement is cut a little bit short because as I look around me and I see all of these machines, every single one of them are completely drained of power and they're all choking out. Like I said, our next goal is going to be a brand shiny new power source. You might even say it's a new glowing power source. Hmm. We still need our DG power till then, but we're already getting some boron. And by adding boron to our steel, we're going to be making ferroboron, the next step in tough alloy production. In the meantime though, with the power system so bad, we have a lot of spare time to get ourselves a proper hopper system. The very first one is gonna be set up on top of the furnace. This way, we can put all of the dust in the chest and have it quickly smelted into ingots. I just need to go into the configuration tab and quickly make sure that it takes an input from the hopper side, and perfect. Now, of course, this doesn't really do much if we don't have a hopper system chest underneath it for all the finished ingots. So, on day eight, we need to run out and get some more wood from the mine shafts. 
for the chest and the next hopper. Then the next hopper system was one of the most important because it's the true beginning of the entire industrial tech processing system. What we do is we place a chest on top of the manufacturing because this way I'll place all of my ores and all of the raw resources I get every time I go mining here to get processed first. But again, with this setup, there's just gonna be a bunch of dust building up inside of the manufacturing, which makes it totally useless. About as useless as a Minecraft YouTuber. So we're gonna to need to get another hopper setup that collects all of the finished ingot products. And to do this, we are gonna to have to dig under the lab, but let's be honest, it's about time we expand this anyway. So this is gonna be just fine. We head down into the moist, dank, soggy, moist cave. And I start to make the lab extend two blocks lower down. I then test the whole system out. And sure enough, the two chests at the bottom are filling up with dust and ingots respectively. Now, I didn't connect the whole thing into one big system because some of the things in nuclear craft actually just need the raw dust. And I have no problem really moving the dust to the furnace by hand because it's just right here anyway. Day nine, and we're starting to get really hungry. Ground cave roots just won't cut it anymore. They keep getting stuck in my teeth. Ugh. Now it's time to get some real food that hasn't already been chewed. And now we're gonna start our very first harvest and replant of our crops. I'm not getting a full harvest this time, especially on the crops like the rice and the beans, because I need to focus on replanting these. But I am gonna get a little surplus in soybeans and in corn. And this should be perfect for at least a little something to hold me over. In order to get any real use out of soy, we're gonna need to run it through a harvest craft machine called a presser. Not the most creative name ever, but that's okay. This will turn our soy into silken tofu. While that works, we are at the last step of getting our tough alloy. We can then combine the ferro boron and smelt it with lithium. After this, we can head back to the presser and we rerun the silken tofu and it will separate into soy milk and firm tofu. Also, we make a saucepan. We can use the saucepan to make cream corn with onions, corn, and a little silken tofu. It's a good start, but we can also add some of the soy milk to some corn in a mixing bowl and get some cornflakes. By the way, guys, quick question just to consider. Do you think you'd be able to replace all of your dairy with soy milk if you had to do it for survival? I don't know. That one would be tough. And we aren't even done with the soy yet. We can make some salt out of water in our bucket and combine that with the silken tofu to get butter. Then we melt that butter over a little corn and we get our biggest meal yet, corn on the cob. All right, after we've done all of that, we can then take all of our sensitive food products and just throw them in the chests along with all of our ores and radioactive materials. Nah, I'm sure it'll be fine. Hey, why are my gums bleeding? To finish up day nine, we finally get this tough alloy and I quickly start to craft more. Now, tough alloy is one of my favorite things in nuclear craft. It basically has the same stats as diamonds. Seriously, you can make tough alloy armor, swords, and picks that are just as strong as the diamonds. Plus, they are jet black and they, they look pretty sick. This might be the best part of nuclear craft in my opinion. And we easily got this done only by day nine too. Now, of course, we're gonna be using our alloy a bit more <clears throat> actively. Hmm? It's supposed to be a reactor pun. We're gonna spend a day in the mines and try to really load up our new hopper system. And then after a full day, we get home and uh, well, we, we do that. We load up the hopper system. So on day 11, we have 20 tough alloy. So it's time to get started on our first big project. Now I, I admit, I'd really love to get started in our molten salt reactor, but that's a big while away and we're already really struggling for power. It would make things much quicker and much easier to make a small fizzy boy first to get our machines to 100%. And while all those ores are running, I make the decision to make a backup farming option by adding a few apple trees. I know I didn't use a lot of fruit trees in my last video or the presser for that matter. So what better reason to add them in right now? Also, while I'm at it, it might be a good idea to close up the cave here that has a giant hole that falls straight into lava. You just maybe. Oh look, a little intern, come to help us. Oh, what's that little guy? Oh, you wanna get credit and have your name on the final project? No, oh. how about instead I put your name on a gravestone? We combine some lead 
and graphite to get basic panels again. Then we just add that around a tough alloy to get a fission reactor casing, AKA the outer shell of our reactor. We head back down to that moist cave below the lab. See, I told you it would come into play. And then we start to set up our three by three by three. We only get the bottom down, so we're gonna need a lot more steel going. Remember, we're super limited on power. It's our main bottleneck. So we should really focus all of our effort on the tech that help us get more tough alloy and more basic panels. By doing this, we get a total of eight more casing blocks. The most expensive part of the fission reactor or any multi-block machine in nuclear craft is the controller block. A fission controller needs magnesium diboride, I hope I'm saying that right, in order to work. And while that sounds pretty big brain science-y, it's actually not too hard. We just smelt some magnesium with boron, and then we combine it with tough alloy. We make a steel frame, and boom, we have our controller. We set up all the casing for the back wall, and then we set up our controller right here up front so that we can quickly access it. Next, we're going to work on the sides, which is easy. It just takes a little more casing. But because I want you guys to have a little show, I'm going to make it transparent casing. This way, you'll be able to see inside of the reactor. Now, we can all be a little bit creepy. We can spy on the reactor, see what it's doing in there. Every good reactor needs control rods, and that's where the coolers come in. Each type of cooler works in slightly different ways and cools for different amounts, but we're gonna be going straight into lapis coolers. They're a fairly effective cooler, and I have plenty of lapis, so we should be able to make a lot of them. But the coolers don't make the power. That's the job for the reactor cells. The more of these you have in your reactor, the more power you'll produce. And of course, the more heat you'll produce. They need glass and tough alloy. And because we need to make our own sand, this is gonna take a little bit longer, but soon we have six cells and four graphite blocks, which boost the efficiency of the cells. You might recognize my classic reactor build. There's four cells in the bottom corners with four graphite blocks on top of each cell. The lapis coolers, which must be touching a cell and a wall of the reactor, will go in between each cell on the top level and the bottom level. Finally, we move on to the tin coolers, which need to be in line with the lapis coolers. So they're going to go in the middle in between the lapis coolers, since we don't have any glowstone yet. So for now, I'm just trying to get all the walls set up and fill in all the blocks that we already have. And honestly, this process is taking longer than it takes the captain to make a single video. So let's try and speed this up by making a few speed upgrades. I need to use a little lapis as well as iron and redstone to make this, but it'll be worth it. Each one of these upgrades will boost the production time of a machine times two, but it also doubles the power demand. So we can't use too many just yet. Next, we're adding this, a reactor port, to the top, because this is where we're gonna draw the power out of the reactor. Then we add in some tin coolers, which again, can be added in between the two lapis coolers. In this particular reactor, we can do this vertically and horizontally, which means we're gonna need a total of six of them. And we're almost there. But we head out to do a little bit more mining, because I'm gonna need a bit more tin and lapis. And while I'm out here, I can hear God knows what's happening up on the surface there. That's one heck of a storm. It's a good thing I'm doing so well down here because I really don't think I want to head up there. It ends up taking us a full two days of mining because I stick to my grind. And, um, well, well, I also got kind of lost down here. Oh, but hey, here's this guy. I'll always have him for company. You still love me, right? Wait, what? What's that? You're leaving me for Forge Labs? What does he have that I don't? You know, other than the millions of subscribers and actual good content. We finally get back home and we finally craft up our last two lapis coolers and we set them in place just as we hear the chaos continuing above us. We get the last tin cooler in as well. And on day 17, we finally get our last reactor cell placed with the casing all put in. There it is. Beautiful. Little, little tiny, but still beautiful. Now, in my haste to try to get this reactor done before day 20, I did skip over one big detail, and that's the actual fuel. A fission reactor runs on nuclear pellets, 
which need to be made out of enriched nuclear materials. In order to enrich uranium for cheap, we need to get in contact with the Soviet Union. Oh, nope, sorry, wrong script. I'm being told by Homeland Security that that was not a funny joke. What I meant to say was that we're going to have to craft up a machine called an isotope separator. This again is a fairly basic machine made out of basic panels, and once we have it set up, we can put thorium in here to enrich it. And uh, admittedly, this machine does take a while, so we're going to rearrange our manufactory hopper to make sure that we're prioritizing thorium dust. Day 18, and we get this thorium 232, the isotope that we need to make thorium bread uranium fuel, aka TBU fuel. Speaking of thorium, this is just me going on like a little rant here, but the future of nuclear power in the real world has to be based on thorium based molten salt reactor. Case in point, a huge part of thorium just decays away into lead, like it does in nuclear craft, zero rads. Also, thorium is very plentiful all the world over. It's a safe fuel to stop climate change. I feel like I have to state my political views here because they've come into question recently, I guess. But enough about my rambling. Let's just get this reactor plugged in. Now, we could just use lead flux ducts to connect it to all of our machines, but this only moves 1,000 RF per tick. And that could get bottlenecked if we start to add more machines. So let's just go straight to hardened flux ducts. These are gonna need some Ingvar ingots, which need iron and a very rare ore called nickel. Luckily, with all of the mining I've been doing and ore doubling, I actually have a pretty good supply of nickel. What we really need here is redstone. By the time we have enough and get back home, we have enough thorium-232 to get our first TBU fuel, and we craft it up with our leadstone flux ducts. Then we use the Ingvar and a bit more redstone to upgrade those to hardened. And now, we just need to make a little outlet in the back wall of the lab and run our flux ducts through here. Negative 1100 cooling. Wow. This reactor is a super stable if we use TBU. And we do get a decent 1100 RF per tick. And now we're cooking with gas. Well, I mean, technically we're cooking with microwaves. But hey, even better. We go from this half-powered machine, take out the DG, and directly plug it into the reactor and go straight to full power, boys. In fact, with all this bonus power, we can really start to add in some of those speed upgrades. We are now processing and doubling our resources at six times as fast with no power lag. So of course now, we're gonna take all of these blocks that were being used on the decay generators and we're gonna process them into nuclear elements and turn them into fission fuels. Now we can plug all of our machines directly into the back power cord. I gotta say, only 19 days in and we're already nuclear powered scientists. Feels good, man. No lie. But let's not stop the big brain plays just yet. As you guys can see, I'm taking one millirad per tick, and my rad meter is actually starting to show just a little bit of yellow. So it's nothing too crazy, but we should probably start to work on some radiation countermeasures, and we'll start with prevention. This is gonna take us a little bit of bioplastic, which needs sugarcane. Luckily, I did see some sugarcane in a dungeon when I first got into the underground, so I should be able to grow a little bit more. So I head back to one of the dungeons where I can hear skeletons and I try to mine around the outside and kind of cheese my way past the mobs trying to break all the spawners. Eh, but there's nothing in these chests, so let's try this again. We'll sneak around just a little bit more. I find this one right here and I try to pop the spawner, but nope, 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 nope. Okay, let them fight each other as I try to get a little bit closer. And hey, we get it. Not too many skeletons spawned either. I can clean them up pretty quickly. Hey guys, we talked about it. Remember, don't shoot the overalls. These are limited edition after all. Also, it hurts my butt. And now my beautiful pants are big time in the red, but it's all worth it. It looks like we fought our way to the top of the wind temple. And sure enough, this chest has a sugarcane block, which is even better. I try and fight my way around a little bit more and get some more loot, but Spiders, uh, look at how they hang up on the roof like that. It's gross. Yeah, I don't want to get too greedy after all. We got exactly what we came for. Wait. Oh my, do you hear that?
Well, judging by the spike in radiation, the ground above me just got hit with thermonuclear weapon. Oh, also the huge explosion kind of tipped me off. Hmm? Just a little bit, you know? As I head back to my base, I start to take super careful notes of my rad meter. It has wildly life-changing differences from spot to spot. Here in my lab, over the open cave system, it's over 50 rad. That is so bad. But back over here by the farms that's tucked away, it's a little bit lower, more like 10. I need to plant some more sugarcane over here. Also, I'm gonna be honest, I'm kind of just staying over here trying to stop from being cooked alive. I mean, I'm gonna have to eventually go back in there to make my radiation shielding. To cure my radiation, I'm gonna need rad away, which takes a fluid infuser and a fluid enricher and a chemical reactor, and a melter. It's gonna take a really long time. We don't have that kind of time. I need to find a quicker fix to this problem. I do find it a little bit ironic here, as all of this is happening, I'm now more reliant on nuclear energy to keep these machines running. I'm trying to craft up a melter. It's the very first machine in the rat away process, but I need to go to the nether first. So, I cut a hole in this wall of obsidian, make a flint and steel, is it obvious I'm panicking a little bit here, and I jump into the nether. Now, I can actually take a breath in here and slow down a little bit to gather my thoughts. Down here, there is no radiation. And while I'm here, I grab some nether rack, quartz, and a little bit of glowstone. Finally, back at base, I craft up a melter and I get it set onto the power cord. Then, I do some quick mining for a minute, and I get coal, lead, and iron. We need these three things to make light radiation shielding. And I'm going to put this into my new tough alloy armor. But, I see that it does a 0.01 rad resistance. That's just not good enough. Like I said, we're going to need better than that to give me a real chance here. I grab a little bit of sugar cane, but not to put in the melter. I'm putting it in the manufactory, because here it will make bioplastic so I can upgrade my medium radiation shielding. We put our medium radiation shielding into my chest to protect my vital organs, but also makes me look like I have bigger pecs for the ladies. Then we put it on and we go from 14 millirads to one. Let's go. Okay, now we might actually live through this whole thing without growing a third mutated arm. We can get working on the rat away to treat the damage that's already been done. I wanna use my sugar cane for bioplastic, so let's find a different source for sugar. Beets should do nicely. I'm actually gonna start using the beets from Harvestcraft, because they can produce twice as much sugar if you process them through the presser. Also, I just think they look nicer. But like literally just then, I, guys, I promise you, I didn't know this before I tried it right here. Vanilla beetroots temporary heal your rats. I literally like stopped what I was doing and had to do a double take to go get those vanilla beets. I start to clear out some farm area to plant them because I already have weakness from the radiation poisoning. So I'm gonna need all the help I can get. Remember guys, we aren't out of the crisis just yet. I add some of the sugar from my beets to the melter to start making molten sugar. So in a moment of stress, I do something maybe questionable and I decide to overclock my reactor. Remember, this reactor design is only rated for TBU fuel. So, when we put in some LEU-235, we get a, wow, 3,000 plus heat. That is a unstable reactor. I very, very carefully boot up the reactor, and it quickly starts to redline. We are producing over double the power, but this is dangerous to say the least. With this overheating, this means I need to manually work the control rods and keep the reactor from going critical. And it does get a little bit spicy, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. But we have enough power to supply the chemical reactor, which is a big part of the mid game in nuclear craft and a necessary machine for the Rataway too. I connect it and soon we're gonna need a little bit more power. So every time we run low, that means I need to go down into the reactor room and push the reactor past its limits. The harder we push, the closer we redline, the more power we get, but oof, do I really need to explain how this also means it's way more dangerous too? We're gonna add just some water to the chemical reactor, as well as adding our molten sugar from the melter. And I see I already have mining fatigue. The next symptom is hunger. 
Then we run out and we get the last bit of 233 fuel. But instead of replacing it, I decide to use a new TBU fuel because this is being way too dangerous. Soon, there's enough molten sugar to add to the chemical reactor to start the ethanol making process. In the meantime, I'm gonna get working on another alloy furnace to make alloy production a little bit easier. This way, we'll be able to make steel and tough alloy at the same time. We craft up a hopper, which is the central part of the fluid enricher, which we're gonna need to make right away. Then, I'm on a roll here, and I can immediately make the fluid infuser to package the right away. But honestly, at this point, I would just suck the stuff off the floor. Then, I place down both of our new machines, and I think we have everything we need. Oh, and speaking of sucking it off the floor, I accidentally spilled this bucket of ethanol, and now there's more alcohol on the floor than a frat house. But after a night of puking and promising I'll never drink again, I get right back to making more Rataway and drinking again. Now we hop back into the nether because Rataway needs glowing mushrooms, which we get lucky. We actually find some of them just right here, right away. But we're gonna need a ton more than just these six. So in order to make them ourselves, we're gonna need glowstone and we're gonna have to get some brown mushrooms so that we can grow our own. Of course, this is all easier said than done when you're suffering from acute radiation poisoning. Mining fatigue makes netherrack feel like obsidian. But hey, we do get our brown mushroom and we even find these bones for a good amount of bone meal so we can power grow the mushrooms. On top of all this, we actually find some more glowing mushrooms on the way out. Is the captain actually getting lucky? Nah, this must be scripted. The captain getting lucky is more sus than dream speed runs. Then I even get returned to sender. Is this impressive? Like, does anybody even care about this anymore? And finally, we make it back. Down in one of the dark caves, we grow up a ton of mushrooms and we harvest up a ton of brownies, like, like brown mushrooms, not, man, now I'm really hungry for fudge brownies. We combine the glowstone and the mushrooms to get the glowing mushrooms and we enrich the ethanol with them. Then we can refuel the actor. Still nice and safe with just some TBU fuel. And then we grab some sugarcane. Because I use the beets as a sugar source, we still have plenty of sugarcane to make a good amount of bioplastic. Which is good, because on day 25, we need a little bioplastic to infuse the Rataway into IV bags. I literally just sit right here. I just wait for the Rataway to be ready to inject it because this is the most important part of the playthrough right now. Seriously, at this point, it's it's in God's hands. I really can't explain how close we came to having to start over right here. Now, the Rataway is nice and all, but we don't want to spend our whole 100 days just making a bunch of it. So we need to focus on protection. This means better radiation shielding. That means beryllium. And that means we need a rock crusher. This shouldn't be too hard, though. But first, let's go check on our chickens. Oh, wow. They're still alive? Honestly shocked. Now on day 26, with my Rataway, I decide I'm gonna be safe from the radiation for a bit, so I might as well focus a little bit on my food. I can use a manufactory to turn rotten flesh into leather. Man, these things are nice. Then we make a book, and we cook that book in a furnace. And yeah, I know I've said this a thousand times, but I really love this cookbook fun. We then add two diamonds to it, and I start to carve out the vault's dining quarters. We use that cookbook to make a cooking table and set it in the middle of the kitchen. And, okay, that, there's a big hole there. I guess we should make this look a little bit better. In fact, I think we should make this whole thing look a little bit better. I don't really know if I wanna use marble like I did for my last bunker, but for now, some bricks will have to do. It's nothing special, but come on guys, at least it's not cobble. Not a full on vault or a bunker just yet, Really, it's just an upgraded cake, kind of. But for now, let's focus on function instead of form and get the kitchen counters in place. For those of you who didn't watch my Harvest Craft video, what are you doing? Go watch that right now. But also, just to catch you up, just in case, kitchen counters can hold food and the cooking table can access these counters to help you make food without knowing the recipes or without holding the food in your inventory. It's pretty sweet. Oh, unless the dish is savory, of course. For me, I'm gonna start out simple, with some garden soup. This is a good starter dish since it'll use just any vegetable. After all, we can't waste too much time on food because we need to get back to mining. I come home after a full day of mining and load up our manufactory with all the raw resources. 
Now we get a ton of sexy TBU, which might as well be called totally beautiful you, you title work in progress. Anyway, speaking of fuels and being in the process, ladies and gentlemen, the fuel reprocessor. <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel like that was a little bit of a stretch. Doesn't matter though. This is a big part of being responsible with our fuels. Instead of having a bunch of nuclear waste just pile up, we can use this to reprocess all of our spent fuels into more fuels and recycle it. Now I can come up here, grab the nuclear waste, and ooh, ow, ouch, ooh, look at that rad meter. Ooh, 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 gotta run it to the reprocessor. Ouch, 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 ooh. Uh, I forgot to make a chest to hold the material. Ooh, ooh. okay, ouch, 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 ouch. This is fine, this is totally fine. Wow, I would have given that idea two thumbs up, but both of those melted off a long time ago. Okay, I quickly put this back. Ouch. And you know what? <laughs> Let's try this really fun idea. Let's actually make a chest and a hopper system to hold this highly radioactive material so that, you know, I don't have to. That'd be fun. Okay, so once again, we can run all this toxic waste from the top chest, check our healthcare status for radiation burns, and ta-da! And now, the nuclear waste is safe. But still don't have any kids for the next few decades. On day 28, I'm out of TBU fuel, and I'm not sure if this is the radiation sickness talking or if I was just feeling really confident. Either way, I decide to carefully try to manage uranium-based fuels again. This of course means we're right back to redlining the reactor. But I mean, you can't make a nuclear omelet without breaking some uranium eggs, right? Now what we can do to make this a little bit safer is upgrading our coolers, which we can do now that we have some glowstone. I wait until the fuel has been spent and most of the RF is used up. Then I, well, I open up a nuclear reactor. Uh, yeah, don't try this at home, kids. We place a copper cooler in the dead center. Poor choice of words there. Then we place the glowstone coolers in the middle on all four sides of the reactor. This should bring the heat down a bit. Just gotta open an active live reactor and uh, ugh. Does, does anybody else taste metal? Um, this isn't good. So now we went from negative 1600 heat per tick to negative 1800 heat per tick. It, it's negative. So it means that the higher number is bet. Well, technically the higher negative is a lower neg. You guys get it. The reactor is cooler now. We turn the reactor back on and yeah, it is better. It's getting hot slower. Still, it really is a ticking time bomb. Oh, oh, that's a sick pun. Oh, it's a ticking time bomb. Because Minecraft uses ticks? Oh, wow, I'm killing it today. Uh, but again, we are standing next to an unstable reactor. Maybe killing it isn't the right word. Now, we finally have a good supply of Radaway and power. I think it's time to get started on our next project, a mechanical mining drill, an immersive engineering masterpiece, in my opinion. It will take some new multi-block machines, but nothing as major as the reactor. The drill itself is easy. The hard part is supplying the fuel, biodiesel, which takes a squeezer to get plant oil. The best way to figure out how to assemble the squeezer, or any machine in immersive engineering, is the engineer's manual. First, we need some creosote oil which is the cornerstone of immersive engineering. Since we only need a little bit of oil, I'm just gonna rework a redstone furnace. We make this simple upgrade here, and then we make the specific upgrade a pyrolithic conversion. I think I totally nailed that. This needs copper plates, and the easiest, cheapest way to do that is to use an engineer's hammer. We then smashy smash the ingots into plates, and soon we get the pyro, we get the upgrade. This will let us turn coal into coke coal and make creosote oil as a byproduct. Of course, this means we need some more coal. Got that part. But after some quick mining and some quick getting lost again, we finally get home and start to produce some creosote oil. And we haven't had a good reactor scare in about three minutes, so let's do that really fast and whoo! This always gets way too close. Just like we planned, we're getting a little bit of creosote oil. And this furnace is gonna fill up pretty fast. So we're gonna make a fluid transponder as a kind of a tank. Soon, 
we get some creosote oil into a bucket. We can then infuse this into some wood to get treated wood. And treated wood is a huge part of making immersive engineering machines, and we're going to need it to make four barrels. Then we craft up a light engineering block, and this just means smashing stuff with a hammer, adding a bit of copper, which we've already been mining. Then we get some steel, turned into steel scaffolding, which we already have a ton of that smelting. Wow, look at this. It's almost like a good tech mod is designed to work with other tech mods. Go figure. Anyway, now we start to assemble the squeezer. I break out some extra room down here, but we don't need too much since it's only a 3x3 three three machine. Just a little baby machine. Yes you are, aren't you? Sorry, I got a little carried away. Okay, so now we're almost done, as you can see in the manual. We only need three more barrels and the piston. Then we just add a redstone block and we hit it real hard with a hammer. <laughs> that actually worked, okay. Now, for the next part, we need to plug it in and look, I'm just gonna be honest with you guys, right now, I messed this part up. You can plug the hardened flux ducts right into an IE machine, including the squeezer and refinery. I just, well, I didn't even try that. I was so used to making these low voltage wires and connectors, it just came naturally. I mean, it works. It's just, it's a lot of extra work that you guys don't need to do. But hey, it does look kind of cool to have these hanging wires. As much as I love nuclear craft, the immersive engineering machines do look a lot better. They're so complex and cool. Uh, we throw the beetroot seeds in here, and soon the plant oil is coming along. And a quick side note, we do craft up a kitchen sink, which is an infinite water source, because why not? Now we are moving on to the next machine, the refinery. Now, normally you would also have to craft up and power a machine called a fermenter and fill it with sugar, but we already have ethanol from the chemical reactor, so we're gonna be skipping that and going right to the very last machine. The refinery is pretty simple. It just takes a little bit more stuff, like heavy machine blocks, which takes steel, but that's not even really a problem. It does take some electrum ingots, which is just gold and silver smelted together in an alloy furnace. So our lab is still pretty capable of handling all this. We make a bit more room in the lab because the refinery is a three by three by five. So it's a little bit of a long boy. And yes, I know I said I was gonna be doing nuclear craft. I was gonna be a nuclear engineer, but I need this drill. It's just that good. Plus all of these immersive engineering machines are being powered by nuclear craft. So that's pretty much the main point of nuclear craft. We run out really quick to get some more iron to make the tanks for the refinery. And then we get home and we start to set up the power cord, which again, you can just run the power cord right in the machine. None of these wires needed. We then get a ton of iron smelted up and turned into iron sheet metal. Again, that's sheet metal. Try not to get confused. I know we're in a sewer, it's easy. But soon we have a beautiful little biodiesel refinery. And we have a dumb little wire hookup system. This is making me cringe just looking at it all over again. The squeezer also has its output hole only one block away from the refinery's input hole. Ooh, so naughty. So with some easy connections from my leftover fewer pipes, soon the plant oil is moving right into the refinery. And we can just manually move over some ethanol from the chemical reactor. And after only a few seconds, we already have some biodiesel made. Nice. I then take this highly flammable fuel in a bucket, and like a brilliant scientist I am, I spill it all over the lab and make things immediately more um, interesting. So I decide I should probably make a jerry can so I can actually properly hold the biodiesel. A jerry can can hold up to 10 buckets at once. So they're a great way to move around and refuel this while you're mining. Speaking of mining, with all this fuel ready, it's time to actually craft up the drill. Like I said, it's pretty easy. Just a heavy machine block. We get some treated wood to make the handles. The drill head itself, I think it's like 23 ingots of steel, but you can easily repair it to full health with four ingots, so not that bad at all. Then we make an engineer's workbench so that we can assemble the drill body, connect it to the drill head. Now we just need a quick fuel up and we don't start mining it. I want to get more beets growing so we can have more plant oil. So we add all these beets to the squeezer and then we get a whole jerry can of ethanol to the refinery. And then we just have to wait a little bit for biodiesel. 
finally, on day 33, we get enough to fill our drill and we can go mining. The steel drill has the same strength as a diamond pick, but it drills a 3x3 tunnel. Honestly, this alone makes Minecraft so much fun. Like, it boosts our mining by times nine. It's so good. And yes, it can mine through obsidian. And yes, it mines through 3x3 three three obsidian too. Whew. Suck it, Mojang. Okay, back home and honestly don't even know what to smell. I, I'm just so excited. I almost want to just go do more mining. But now that I have this on my side, it's time to focus on something else. Like getting a better fuel source, for example. I kind of want to experiment with some plutonium fuels that I've never tried before. I need to turn these tiny clumps into proper materials and, whoa, look at that, 300 plus. Okay, well, I can't do this for too long. Honestly, that's some of the highest rads I've ever seen. Luckily, I only need to hold them for a few seconds and I can place them right back. So no harm, no foul, even if it does cost me a rad away. And that was pretty bad, but what's pretty good is while I'm looking for new fuels, I see this, MOX, or Mixed Oxide Fuel. This is made out of weapons-grade plutonium and some reprocessed uranium, a great way to recycle nuclear warheads into something less boomy, and also we can recycle our nuclear waste. All we need to do is infuse some plutonium-239 with oxygen. So how do we get oxygen? And don't answer just breathe in, smart guy we're gonna need another machine. And to run that machine, we are gonna need a little bit of fuel. And so in the meantime, we're gonna try out some new HEU or highly enriched uranium 233. Now, now, I get it. This is extremely dangerous, but I'm only using this fuel to make enough power to get other safer fuels. Plus also 10 KRF, I mean, come on. But not giving into that temptation, like I promised, I'm gonna craft up an electrolyzer so we can get oxygen. It takes a huge amount of power and time to run it, but it can break down water into its base materials, which I'm sure you little geniuses know is hydrogen and oxygen. We head out for some quick mining while that's happening because it does take a long time. Then I decide to expand our beet farm out just a little bit. As sad as this is, the most efficient thing to do right here is to just eat vanilla beetroots for the radiation protection. I'm not giving up on harvest craft, but it's kind of just a hobby and a background thing at this point. It's really not necessary. And on day 35, sure enough, we have some oxygen in the electrolyzer, which we immediately add to the plutonium. I gotta say, it's kind of weird to use the same fluid enricher to make Radaway as it is to make plutonium fuels. It is what it is. Well, we still have a little leftover power from the HEU fuel, so we make a rock crusher and we add it to the lab. This is to crush up anisite into beryllium. And luckily, the sewer is full of anisite. What it doesn't have is granite or diorite. So I need to head to the nether to get some quartz. Crushing up both diorite and granite is so important to nuclear craft. It actually makes it worth it to use quartz to make them if you can't find any, and I, I can't find any. Speaking of things I can't find, I need yellow flowers to make the hazmat suit. So. I don't know guys, without being able to go to the surface to find flowers, this might actually be hard. Instead, I'm just going to have to be okay with adding heavy shielding to my tough alloy armor. It makes me sad, but this MOX fuel, it makes me pretty happy. This fuel has a few perks, one of which is that it's pretty cool burning, lower than HEU for sure, but also lower than LEU by about two thirds. At the same time, it produces more than double the RF and burns much slower and lasts quite a bit longer. It has the true power potential of plutonium with the relative safety of uranium, kind of. And now that we are powered up proper and after an hour of nuclear crafting, it's time to get focused on my very first ever molten salt reactor. Oh, oh no. I see right away that it takes elite panels. These are so expensive. They need calcium sulfate and that's, well, it's a huge, long process to make that. Okay, here we go. I better get a ton of views on this video for this. Okay, first, we need fluoride water, which is actually not too hard. We need fluoride, which we can get from crushing diorite, 
then adding that to water in an enricher. So realistically, we're probably gonna need a whole new set of machines just for the direction of this stuff. So we add on another power cord on the other side of the lab. We get the fluoride water with a little enricher, easy. Then we need sulfuric acid, which we get from adding water to sulfur trioxide, which we get by adding oxygen to sulfur dioxide. And yes, you guessed it, we get sulfur dioxide by adding oxygen to sulfur, which of course has to be processed out of rocks from the rock crusher and then melted down in the melter. It is a crazy process. But hey, we wanted to play nuclear craft, so here we go. It's a lot of chemical reactor work. So we empty out ours and we store up or use all the products that we had in it. We need sulfur. Now luckily, there's lots of ways to get sulfur. And one of those is by crushing granite, which we already have a little bit of. Oh man, I used to play Rust and I remember just farming sulfur from rocks. God, I miss that game. So I decided that we should move our melter over here so it's closer to the other machines and we load it up with sulfur. Then we get our first oxygen from the electrolyzer and we add it to the sulfur in the chemical reactor. And remember, it takes two injections of oxygen, so the electrolyzer is gonna be working overtime. So after a full day of trying to get some oxygen, we still barely have enough to get a full batch of sulfur dioxide. So I'm thinking it's time for us to add some more speed upgrades to our electrolyzer, but it's already a huge energy hog. So we're gonna need some help. We crush up some quartz, then we crush up some obsidian, both in the manufactories. If we craft up some gold pressure plates, we can make ourselves an energy upgrade, which makes any machine use half the power it normally would. So yeah, it's a big bonus to the electrolyzer for sure. Soon, after a full day trying to make oxygen, we have enough sulfur dioxide so that we can, yep, you guessed it, add more oxygen. This process might need some optimizing. So we work our way all around the cave, collecting some precious gold. We can use it to make more energy upgrades, but let's be real, it's speed that we really want. So I start to make some, uh, oh man, oh no. That was the perfect spot to make a need for speed joke. I missed it, boo. Okay, we are getting close to our sulfuric acid. We make enough sulfur trioxide to try and make our very first batch, but it has to go through the chemical reactor a third time. Now we need to add water. Finally, we get a full bucket's worth of sulfuric acid. And you guessed it, now we need to run it through the chemical reactor once again. This time we have to add that fluoride water. Okay, this is too much reusing the chemical reactor. It's way past due to craft up another one. So we set this one up on the other side of the lab and we load it up with the sulfuric acid and then we throw in the fluoride water. Soon, we have a whole lot of hydrosulfuric acid. It is a super strong acid and it produces just a little bit of calcium sulfate. You know, the thing that we've actually wanted to get out of this process the whole time. So I decided to craft up another little portable tank so that we can safely store up the excess super angry juice and actually harvest the remaining calcium sulfate. But we aren't done yet. Nope, in nuclear craft, you're not done till you die we have to add a crystallizer to turn the calcium sulfate into its powder form. After doing all of this, I really could use a vacation. Sadly, in a highly irradiated world, the best I'm gonna get is going mining for a day, but I'll take it. Back at home, we finally have four calcium sulfate. But before we can use that, I realized something. If we're gonna be dedicating these machines to making more molten salt reactor components, then we're gonna have to put a pause on our Radaway production and this could be a little bit dangerous. So it might be a good idea to invest in better radiation protection, like right now. Luckily, with all the sulfur, uranium, and beryllium we've been processing, we can already easily make it all the way up to heavy radiation shielding. I then make a tough alloy helmet and add the shielding to protect the best tool I have, my brain, or whatever's left of it. I also have the mats to make another heavy shield but before I get to adding that to my gear, I decide to try and make some elite panels just to see if I'm actually gonna be able to do this correctly. So using the calcium sulfate that we got from that whole process, we can make a crystal binder, 
so at least this brain is getting a little something right. Then I decided I should put on some more protection before I continue. Now I know I should probably put this protection into my chest, protect my most valuable parts, so of course I put it in my crotch plate. Just like my brain, I have to protect this, because I'm definitely going to be using it. Ch shut up, you don't know! With some decent protection, I finally craft up my first elite panel, and it feels pretty good to do this. But it feels kind of bad because I'll need to make so many more of these. It takes more sulfur, and, and then it takes more boron ingots, and it takes more calcium sulfate. I am so emotionally broken as a human being right now. Day 42, and I'm just staring deep in thought into my reactor. Is that a creeper? Okay, well, you don't need to be a nuclear physicist to know that that's not good. There's uranium and plutonium spilled all over the open area. Not to mention the ruptured fission reactor right next to me. And guess who's going to have to clean up this big elephant's foot? Good thing I made the radiation shielding just now. I quickly scramble to recollect and contain the radioactive materials. When the reactor is compromised, it shuts down, so we don't have a full-on Chernobyl on our hands here. Yet. Luckily, the controller didn't get destroyed, and we can shut this all down before it goes critical, and turn this Chernobyl into a three-mile island kind of instead. Wait, do you guys not get the reference there? Trust me, it's better. It's much, much better. But after this small accident, my passion for making a reactor that is more stable has definitely been rekindled. Okay, what do we need now? Oh, just some bronze? Well, that's easy. Just copper and tin. I mean, I think we all know that. People have known the recipe for bronze since, well, the Bronze Age. Duh. Kind of on a roll right here. I just crafted up the most expensive block in this whole bunker. Okay. We want this to be safe. I'm going to set this over in the netherite chest, because it's a little demon core. Now, we need to craft up the walls of the reactor, which just takes a 8 steel and 8 tough alloy per block. But luckily, we're already mass-producing both of those items, so it really shouldn't be a problem. Honestly, it's just going to be a little bit of time. Let's get some food and grab some more beets for our radiation protection. Throw all the seeds in the squisher and grab some biodiesel. We head out and do some mining and waste a little time grinding out for some mats for whatever project comes next, we get back home and I'm feeling much better. I get both alloy furnaces pumping out a ton of steel because remember, it takes steel also to make tough alloy. Then I see I'm out of power. Hmm. Okay, I guess I need to go run the reactor, but the reactor's full of RF. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, oh man. The creeper attack must have disconnected the reactor from the power cord. That means this whole entire time we've been running on backup RF. It's kind of disappointing. At least it's an easy fix. I then craft up some tough alloy boots. Let me explain hard carbon. You just combine diamond, hard, and graphite, carbon, and you get the hard carbon. We then add some more heavy shielding to our shoes, and now we have a pretty solid set of protection. I get one last piece of shielding, because remember, we actually only have medium shielding on our chest. I need to have the armor at full health to add the shielding, so it's time to make a classic anvil. And then we can just plug in the better shielding. Now I have a full radiation slash combat set of good looking gear. Day 45, and now you've probably noticed two things. One, this video is at day 45 and it's already an hour and 10 minutes long, but I still have a lot of calcium sulfide to make. I am going to cut out most of the calcium sulfide production process. I don't want you guys to have to suffer through all this like I did. Instead, I'll just show you all the fun parts, like making the molten salt reactor itself. Now, I know I want to put it down here, but I also know it'll be massive when it's finally done. So it's time to drill out some extra space for this beast. Finally, we start to set down the first parts of the MSR, starting with the frame. The frame blocks are pretty different from the walls of our old reactor. And it takes a bit more steel, but it's pretty much the same concept. The frames make the outer border of the reactor, which makes more sense, unlike the fission reactor, which like weirdly has no frames. Kinda naky, I guess. Then it's back to the mines while we smelt up more steel. And when we get back home, we can start up more reactor mats. But then on day 47, we craft up the most important item in this entire playthrough a bean burrito, 
I still haven't given up on you, Harvestcraft. Not yet. Oh, but I guess I probably should be focusing more on the reactor, huh? We start to get the frame in place. This is only going to be a 2x2x3, two by two by which is all you really need for my design. But I'm actually thinking I might rework this so that it's a little bit more better for you guys all to see. After all, I'm not just doing these playthroughs for fun. I'm doing these for you. But also, it, it's nuclear craft, so it's mostly fun. Day 48, and I see that the steel production is in overdrive, and it's looking real good. This gives me a little bit more confidence to expand the reactor and add some more space so that we can all see inside of it a little bit. I spend a little bit of time here looking around and rethinking my design that I'm making on the fly. I'm pretty sure this will all work out properly, but I mean, it's a very expensive machine and I've never built it before in Minecraft. So, you know, maybe measure twice, craft once. For now, I'm back in the mines trying to get some iron because the new build might use it all. Plus the turbine is super iron heavy, but I'll explain all that later. I'm still trying to make sure this redesign is gonna work right. It could ruin the whole playthrough. I know I'll need four vents no matter what I craft, and as soon as I have all those vents in place, then I think it's time to demolish it. Now all I'm really doing is I just wanna stretch everything out by one block so that we'll be able to have some space in the middle of the reactor so that we can see what's happening inside. Otherwise, what's the point of the transparent walls, right? We get our three by three by three looking pretty good. Man, I'm really addicted to three by three by three reactors. Okay, let's start to craft the blocks that will actually go inside. Does that say more elite panels? Okay, fine, let's make the coolant for- Those take elite panels too? I honestly don't even know if 50 days is gonna be enough to get all of this done. But here we go. I'm running the old fission reactor and I look over at the MSR and for a second, I'm kind of wondering if I should just give up. I mean, maybe the surface has healed. Maybe we don't need it. Closer. Is that the flash? No way! The mushroom cloud! Oh, that's too close. The mushroom cloud is literally right there. That's so close. Okay. That means the fallout is going to be here in just moments. Soon, radiation is going to come pouring through the cave system. Man, this is even worse than I thought. This cave system was directly hit. And now, this whole chamber is exposed directly to the radiation from the surface. And even with my gear protecting me, the rad level is skyrocketing. I'm not gonna lie, I'm kinda panicking here. What am I even supposed to do about something like this? I can see an opening at the end of the tunnel. Okay, first things first, close off contamination. I'm just gonna be chugging as many beats as I can, but it barely does anything. This will only be temporary. In Chernobyl, in order to stop the radiation, they use a sarcophagus of lead and steel to seal away the radiation. There's too much radiation in too big of an area to contain, but I can contain myself. So I start to craft up steel sheet metal to protect the reactor room from any more debris that could come blasting down the cave. All the while I'm doing this, I am chugging through my rat away. We need to work quick protect the farm, the lab, and the living quarters from radiation, not just debris. So I start to turn my lead into sheet metal. This will not only stop fallout from moving through the air, but it will also slow the radiation from the outside material. I start making a small wall, but this is not nearly enough. Every single day that passes, the longer this takes, the more contamination will fill the bunker. I try to drill down deeper to get away from the heavy radiation, but it doesn't work. The radiation has spread deep through the sewer system and is way down in the caves. I'm not gonna be able to run away from this one. 
I need to seal up my area. I need to finish the vault. I'm focusing everything I have and trying to collect and smelt up all of my lead as quickly as I can. And I have the cave mostly sealed off, but mostly sealed off doesn't really do that much when it comes to radioactive particles, does it? I'm going as fast as I can, but deep down in the back of my mind, a nuclear blast that close without any finish sort of protection means that the radiation is just going to be a part of our lives, no matter what. Any other food is no longer viable. I can only eat beets from now on. If a single piece of my protective gear breaks, I'm dead. And I always need to have ample amounts of rat away at my disposal at all times. The radiation has even cooked my tree. It's turned blood red. Good news is the lead shielding is almost in place. I only have a few small gaps. Then, to seal everything off, I make these thick steel engineer's doors designed to be blast and radiation resistant. I put them in place. And so much for going through that cave system again. I use a hammer to get the very last one right. Finally, we've stopped the increase in rad levels, even though they're pretty high as it is. I peek outside and I see that the rad levels out here are over 50. No, 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 no. This is officially a no man's land. We cannot go out here ever again for the rest of the playthrough. I then continue to add lead sheet metal all over any other cave entrances, just in case radiation leaks in other ways too. The final shield is helping out and it's actually looking pretty cool too. The doors add this modern metal look to what a vault should look like. And now that there's no immediate threat, I can turn my attention to cleaning this place up a little bit. I really don't want to get caught unprepared like this ever again. Now I know I spent way too much time in my last video building, I read the comments, so I won't get too carried away here. Still, this is just a cave, and it should be a proper bunker. Besides, I'll keep my eye on the lab and make sure that everything is still producing at full speed. After that harsh radiation bath, my rads are getting a little bit trickier to manage. It feels like every few minutes or so, I start to get mining fatigue again. And yes, mining fatigue even applies when you're using mining drill. Somehow. Day 57, and now I'm really starting to feel like a little rad roach. I start to craft up a bunch of steel sheet metal. Then I turn some of that sheet metal into thin sheet metal slices. They're called, well, they're called sheet metal slices. These actually work a lot like trap doors. In the end, about four ingots worth of steel turn into 16 slices, so I can cover my ceiling and my floors with a strong, sick looking metal finish for pretty cheap. But we aren't done there. I decide to make my walls out of marble as a little nod to my old bunker. But this time we're gonna use the chisel mod to make it look even better. I then start to demo out the walls get this castle looking dark age cave into a proper atomic age bunker. I pick a marble pattern that looks like a 50s sci-fi look, something that even Todd Howard would be proud of. Only problem is, well, I, I haven't been focusing on harvesting marble, so we gotta spend some time mining it, and we've got some catching up to do. Soon, we have just enough marble to finish the walls of the dining quarters, so now we can get an idea of what a finished room might look like. So far, I really like this look. I add these blast doors to trap, <coughs> I mean, protect the vault dwellers. And next, we start our work on the floor. I can quickly take out chunks, and then I throw sheet metal in its place. I make sure to get the floor of the dining quarters fixed too. And by the end of day 58, I gotta say, I'm really liking this dark, modern, sterile looking, yet retro feeling vault. And then, you know, cause I, didn't feel like things were dangerous enough in the last few minutes, I make a side waste dump area to store my hydrosulfuric acid. I'll need it later, but for now, it's starting to build up a little bit. And more good news is that we have a good amount of calcium sulfate, and now we can return to building our molten salt reactor. I then start to fix up the lab as well. We get the beginnings in place with the marble walls and the sheet metal ceiling, but again, we are going to need to go out and get a whole lot more marble if we want to get this finished. Seriously, this takes a whole lot of marble. But 
The reason I stopped to get so much is because I have much bigger plans than just filling in the lab walls. I also want to make a giant marble statue of the captain. What better use of your time? Nah, you know what? Maybe in 200 days. For now, I'm just so pumped on this awesome marble sheet metal laboratory. In fact, I'm so excited that when I'm trying to fix up the floors, uh, ooh, kind of forgot that there was this massive drop off all the way down to bedrock right below the lab. And when it's all finally said and done, I take a second look over it all and dude, this looks so cool. Can't enjoy it for too long though. Gotta get back to work. After all, I gotta make sure that that sulfur keeps getting oxygenated or oxidized. It gets oxygen combined. You know what I'm talking about here. Soon, we have a bit more calcium sulfate and we keep on working to get our elite panels, but it's a slow process to say the least. Finally, we get four elite panels finished and with just a few small other components thrown in, we can craft up the first molten salt fission vessel. Here's the ugly little secret though. We need five more of these. Yeah, the thing that took 60 days to make, we need five more. So if I wanna get this done before this video becomes a thousand days, I better start investing in energy upgrade. Let's head down to the MSR and see how we're gonna fit the fission vessel in place. These blocks are the ones that actually hold the nuclear fuel in the reactor. I place it up against the vent, then shift, right click, to make the opposite side say default, or like an entrance. This is where the molten salt fuel will enter the reactor. We then set the side facing us to fuel spread to move the fuel further into the reactor. I'll explain more about this whole thing when we get more components here. For now, all you need to know is that we need a ton more calcium sulfate. And to help us get it, we need a ton of energy upgrades. In order to get more energy upgrades, we're gonna need more crushed quartz, but for now, I'm gonna try to evenly spread the upgrades that we have out to make the load on the reactor just a little bit lighter overall. And all this while, take a look at my hunger bar. I've been so focused, I didn't even see that I've moved into the hunger advanced phase of radiation poisoning. I get more upgrades and I add them to the electrolyzer cause this machine really needs them. I then make a stack of iron pressure plates and use all the redstone to make 62 speed upgrades in total. A lot of these speed upgrades will be used in the electrolyzer. But honestly, we really need to make sure we add a lot of energy upgrades here too. I then, once again, get the reactor way too close to a full meltdown. And speaking of not paying attention, I'm starting to load up the chemical reactor with upgrades. And on the way to start the reactor down here, I start to feel myself slip out of consciousness. My rads are in the final stage, full on poisoning. I'm losing hearts fast. If I didn't have Radaway in my hot bar right now, this video would have been 62 days in a bunker. Honestly though, that was really clumsy. I could have really been in trouble there. I should really be more careful. I add the other speed upgrades to the electrolyzer and just take a second to think. The energy and speed upgrades combo is starting to yield some good results though, as I've managed to collect quite a bit of crystal binder. Keep adding them to any machine that is slowing the process down, AKA still the electrolyzer, but soon we have our second fission vessel. And this one only took three days. But once more, the mines call us and we have to go fill our inventory once again. We get back and move a ton of molten sulfur to the chemical reactor. It's actually so much that the output of sulfur dioxide starts to overflow and I need to craft up a portable tank to hold the excess sulfur dioxide. Soon, by day 64, we have over 45 little piles of crystal binder and we can start to pump out a whole lot of elite panels. In the end, we managed to get another vessel. So let's go and place these two. Now I can shift while placing a fission cell to copy the first fission vessel. This way, the fuel will come in the vent and move through these two vessels. Then I place the third vessel and make a default on the side of the other vessels so that it will continue to move to this third one. I'm gonna make it then turn by making this side a fuel spread. Did any of that make any sense? I hope you guys can at least kind of follow this. I'll try to explain it more as we get finished, but this should work. I, I guess we'll see. Ah, day 65 and 66 are spent down in the mines just trying to make sense of my crazy life. And day 67 is spent staring deep into the reactor, wondering, who am I? What am I? 
I start to add some oxygen to some 233, and this will allow us to make highly enriched fuel. <laughs> so this can't go wrong, right? Then we make another fission vessel, and I set that one into the reactor. I'm trying so hard here to make this at least a little understandable, but I know it is confusing, guys. So we put this over in the far upper corner and set the default to the side fuel can spread down this way. There'll be an open gap in the middle, so hopefully you guys will be able to see the flow direction of the fuel as it moves through the reactor. I then start to melt some arsenic, again, not dangerous, and this will be used to help us with our coolant heater, the other component of a molten salt reactor. This process is going to take forever, but now I'm committed. I have to see this through. I then decide since day 69 is coming, I should add a sex dungeon. Oh, is that word not allowed on YouTube? Okay, um, let's add a love room. And this all works perfectly. The walls and metal ceiling are perfect for cleaning up. No stains. Then we want to make a nice entrance and hallway through the entire vault, because we will be having guests soon. The actual hull of the vault itself is going to be made out of sheet metal. Then inside of the vault, the marble will be the inner walls to divide up all of the rooms, love or not. By the end of day 69, the vault is looking great, with only the farm being open, because I kind of like this area being a natural open cave, at least until I change my mind. On day 70, boy was I wrong about an easy cleanup, and now we're going to have to plaster over all the filth with some more walls. And now we have a half vault, half cave looking bunker in this part. Then we run out of our MOX fuel, and I need to put in the highly enriched fuel. And well, as the name suggests, it's a hot boy. 6K heat per tick. Woo! This is a spicy one, no lie. I make sure to get back to farming mushrooms and turning them into glowing mushrooms, cause now in the back of my mind, I'm a little afraid of what's coming on day 75. I'm convinced there's gonna be another wave of nukes coming in just four days. I then craft up another fission vessel and even have enough booty to get our last fission vessel as well. So with that, we can finish the vessel system in the MSR. I place the fifth vessel on the fuel spread side of the fourth vessel, and I set it up. Default over there and fuel spread towards me. We finally get the last vessel in place. This one, however, will be a little different. It must be set up at the very end with a depleted out instead of a fuel spread. This means the only thing that will come out of this side will be waste product. Think of it kind of like a, a butthole. And while well, that whole system is looking pretty good, sadly, it's only about halfway done since we need to add a set of six coolant heaters, which we need to craft. In order to do this, we need to add a thermal expansion centrifugal separator. Yeah, I'm sure I nailed that name. The heaters need thermoconducting alloy, which is what the arsenic is all about. We need it for boron arsenide. We just need to use the melter to melt down some boron to go with the arsenic. But we already have this melter full of molten farts, aka molten sulfur. So I turn this portable tank into a porta potty and I fill it with the molten sulfur. Then we get the boron bumping and woof, look at how it's spewing out. That looks dangerous. And really quickly, I'll show you guys. Before we leave, I'm gonna repair the drill. Only takes four steel. Then we run into the nether and we grab some magma blocks. When we get back to our bunker, we get the molten boron and the molten arsenic into a chemical reactor. Once we have our molten boron arsenide, man, this, this really feels not safe to be having in my hands. We can then craft it into a solid form using an ingot former, which is a pretty nice machine because it actually doesn't use any power. So then we use the ingot former to make something that is, hmm, Definitely not in the shape of an ingot, but fine. Then we add this not ingot to an extreme alloy. By the way, the extreme alloy is just a hard carbon alloy with a little tough alloy and hard carbon alloy. See, I'm a good teacher. As a reward for my teaching, I get our first coolant heater, which is by far much better than any salary teachers get in the real world. Soon, we get some blaze powder from the centrifugal separator. And with this, we can add some sulfur and redstone to get pyrethum dust. Ooh, that sounds fun. This gives us hardened glass, which we need to hold our crazy nuclear salts. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect the vessels and the heaters with these pipes 
so we'll be able to actually see the fluids moving through the reactor. You could easily just have this reactor be too wide and not have these pipes in the middle. I'm just doing this purely for the sake of the video. You can now see how the fuel goes from the left, moves through the servo arrows to the exit on the right tube. Okay, now let's see what day 75 has in store for us. An earthquake? Hmm, well I'm from LA. An earthquake should be just fine with me. What's not fine with me is just how hot this reactor is getting. Speaking of which, I'm noticing that my power is really starting to drop off. When I head down to my reactor, I get a small lag spike. And I see that the power is actually disconnected. I'm thinking that the earthquakes might be moving things around slightly in the world. And I'm really gonna have to pay attention to things like this. On day 76, I take a minute to think over all of my fuels. The highly enriched fuel is pretty dangerous. And if we get hit by another earthquake, ooh, it might be smart to get a more stable fuel just to get us to the MSR. After all, this could be really dangerous if we get hit by a big enough lag spike, just like that one. At a quarter of a second, which I couldn't get to the lever, now this, a total reactor meltdown. This corium starts pouring through the cracks of the reactor. I craft up a tank, which soon is going to serve as a hazardous materials barrel, and use my buckets to start to collect and store up all of the nuclear waste just pouring out of everywhere. And this entire time I'm dealing with this nightmare, I'm taking huge doses of super heavy radiation. Corium is a collection of nuclear materials going critical, molten steel, glass, basically think of lava, then make it spicier. It's a good thing we made such good shielding for my gear, and I have so much extra rat away. And this whole time, every second I get a chance, I'm eating as many beets as I can. And I'm using up so much rat away. Those 10 rat away might as well be my HP. As soon as those are gone, so am I. This was so dumb. And honestly, it sets us so far back, assuming it doesn't kill us outright. Soon, we finally get the last bit of molten death cleaned up. And just then, I see another danger. The same earthquake that broke the reactor has caused lava to flood the cave system. We are now surrounded by lava and radiation from the bomb. The world has pretty much surrounded us in Corium. Now, this bunker really is the only thing keeping us safe. We have a dead reactor. Now the machines had a little bit of reserve power in them, but soon they were gonna run dry too. Then what? Now I need to make sure I only use exactly the power I need by making exactly the materials I need. A big part of this is very carefully managing the energy upgrades and moving them around. And I just hope this will give me enough to remake the reactor. I was using a lot of the upgrades to help make all the molten salt fuels, but all that's really gonna have to wait. I even have to go back using conventional furnaces to make more glass. This is not good. Finally, I'm able to craft up a measly two cells, and that's about it. Plug them in where the old cells were, but there's just too much damage all throughout the reactor and too little power. I do manage to craft up four lapis coolers, but that's only good enough for the bottom layer. But then it hits me. I don't technically need to repair the entire reactor to get at least a little bit of it running again. And just as I start to have a little bit of hope, thinking I might actually be able to get this running with only a few cells, I hit a dead end. Zero power. I need to craft up the controller. And that's it. I just straight up don't have enough power to do it. Every machine is completely flatlined, which means it's time to dig up the old decay generators. It's back to basics. Just behind the lab where the power cord is running, I add all of our DGs, and then I load them up with all of our reserve nuclear materials. This is actually a good use for all of our Neptunium, since I had no idea what I was really gonna do with them. I forgot just how inefficient decay generators really were. This is hard to look at but they do work. And soon 
we have a reactor port, and we managed to craft a reactor controller. Now finally, we are going to have to cannibalize the parts that are on the top layer, and we can use some of the coolers and the casing to finish the bottom half. But soon, by making some sacrifices and a little innovative thought, we have the reactor working again. It's about half as powerful as it used to be, but it's better than going back to using those decay generators. We make some MOX fuel because I'm never going back to the highly enriched fuels ever again. And boom, we have a somewhat back online nuclear reactor, making us some power. So what's the first thing we're gonna be making with all this new power? Well, more reactor parts, of course. We may be down to about half power, but that's still enough to start making the reactor back to its old self. But we'll need more lapis for coolers. So I'm gonna head out to the mines when I see not only has the lava been rising near our base, but there has been a huge cavern opened up by the earthquake. The entire fault line just missed our vault by only about 50 blocks, and this is completely flooded in lava. After a day of pooping myself over how scared I am about that, I get back to crafting up and repairing the reactor. I pop my top off so that all the boys can see, and then I stack our cells in the same spots, but we actually continue to add more cells, and I add a fourth layer using my old tin coolers. We then drill up into the ceiling to make the reactor go even higher. I add more cells on a fifth level, making this reactor almost double the strength of our old one. I make some TBU fuel just to compare the baseline stats. And this reactor makes 1500 power compared to the old reactor at the same fuel level. So I guess every meltdown has its silver lining or uranium lining maybe, I don't know. In the end, this all worked out pretty well. Now, all that being said, I would still gladly prefer to have an MSR. So I'm gonna get right back on to start working on those components. I'm gonna be using MOX fuel again, since the reactor is strong enough to deal with it. In fact, I decide to lock myself in the lab and only focus on making MSR components. And so I managed to craft up three heaters. And by day 81, I craft up heater number four and heater number five. Honestly, I probably should have been upgrading the reactor earlier. In order to get the very last heater, we are gonna to have to go back into the mines, but that's fine. I've been trying to get these heaters for the past two hours RL, so it's probably about time I go outside. Oh, but only in game, of course. We then craft up some more sugarcane to make Rataway, and I see that it's so red. It doesn't even really look like sugarcane anymore. Ooh. I start to make sure I'm gonna stockpile up enough Rataway to make it through the last 100 days. And while I'm doing this, I can start to hear explosions going on outside. They're a little too small to be nuclear, but I mean, I don't like any kind of explosion above my head, really. Soon, we get ourselves 13 Rataway, and also the last heater. Now, let's go and install all six of them all at once. So, we start at the other end, and we set this one at the very bottom with the default on the opposite side so the fuel will enter in this way. We then make this side fuel spread. We then shift click and place the middle one to copy those settings. The corner heater has a default facing the middle and the fuel spread turned to the right across the reactor to get to the fourth heater. Then the fuel will be taken in through a default port from the fluid duct with the servo to push it through. Then we add the fifth and sixth making sure that we set them up correctly, which of course means that we make the last heat the depleted out. Remember the butthole. Oh, and what a beautiful butthole it is. We add some tanks to hold all the fuels and the coolants. The coolant we'll be using is called Eutetic Knack, and it's gonna be a problem all on its own. So what will we be doing with all this coolant, you might be asking? Time for the heat exchangers. Yes, that's right. We need another multi-block machine just to handle the coolant. Hey, it's nuclear craft. You don't like making complex machines? You're gonna be upset. Luckily, the heat exchanger is much cheaper and it really only takes some steel and tough alloy. Again, we need to set the framework down and I'm gonna make this one just a one by two by like five long here. The whole idea of the heat exchanger is to run heat exchanger blocks full of Utech knack next to heat exchanger blocks full of water 
turning the water into steam. So we really only need two rows. The only thing that's holding us back is we're gonna have to craft up a whole lot of steel. But soon, we can set down our controller. Then we really start to work on setting out all the framework. And I'll admit it right away, I'm not in love with what we have going on here. After all, if you think about it, the more contact we have with the Utetic Knack, the more steam we'll get, and the more efficient this whole system will be. So, if I want to add on to the heat exchanger, I am going to need a little more boron. I knew boron was kind of hard to find, but I'm realizing it's actually pretty rare. So here we are, a full two days of mining, and we only have 13 days left to get this mega, mega, multi-machine system all working, and uh, it's going to be close. So let's get started on producing the fuel. Speaking of fuel, we've run out of MOX, so we're going to have to get some TBE fuel in the reactor. This might slow us down, but a slowdown is better than a meltdown. We need another electrolyzer for the fuel, which again, takes way too much power. We get another chemical reactor going, and I need to really make sure we have a stronger power source here. So I end up going back down to make more MOX fuel. It's really just my favorite fuel. With another chemical reactor to finish day 88. Then on day 89, it's right back down in the mines. We grab and then smelt up a ton more iron for steel, which we're gonna need for our heat exchanger frames. And we're gonna need a lot more heat exchanger frames cause yeah, you guessed it. I did another redesign right in the middle of building yet another reactor machine. When it comes to my first design, I must say I just wasn't fully satisfied. That's what she said. The reason I'm expanding the heat exchanger is because even with TBU fuel, the molten salt reactor will produce a ton of hot eutetic knack. The heat exchanger could be our bottleneck if it's too small. And that's what she said, oh. So once again, we end up building our trusty dusty three by three by five. The internal components of the heat exchanger are much cheaper than the molten salt reactor with some hard carbon really being about the worst of it. Once again, we make the opposite side default and then this side fuel spread inward toward the heat exchanger. Then shift place to copy this, the whole length of the heat exchanger tubes. This one is gonna be holding the actual eutetic knack. Then we have the depleted out butthole and we can start to add our water tubes, which are actually the exact same blocks only you have to set them up so that they don't flood with the knack and mix with the water. We put default on the top of this because this top tube will be drawing water from the top of the heat exchanger. We have the fuel spread along the tube toward the back of the heat exchanger. So we have the maximum amount of contact with the knack tube. Also, the depleted out is going to be facing upwards towards the top of the heat exchanger as well. So this time it's less of a butthole and more of a blowhole. Now, the reason we expanded this tube was to fit even more water tubes on the sides of the knack tube. So this tube we're placing right now on the left side is also going to be carrying water. Default to the side and then fuel spread all the way down the side of the tube towards the end. Then we'll have another water tube on the right side of the knack tube. So I'm hoping you can kind of visualize what's going on in your head. The superheated eutetic knack will flow out of the MSR into the middle of the heat exchanger. Then water tubes will be all around the knack tube, being heated up and quickly become a ton of high pressure steam. Finally, on day 91, we have all the hard carbon heat exchanger tubes in place. The water will enter the heat exchangers from the sides and the top, turn to steam, and then they'll exit the sides and the top once again. And now we just need to finish it up and seal everything in with some shelves. And of course that does require a little bit more iron. So we're back to the mines. By day 92, we're ready to add our fluid ducts and connect everything. To fill these fluid ducts with water, we're gonna craft up an infinite water source. We can make a compact water source by combining eight normal infinite water sources. This thing will really be pumping out a lot of steam. So we really need to make sure we have a lot of water because there has to be more coming down these pipes than the amount of water that was running down my face when I heard about Technoblade. You will be missed, Alex. If we pop open the exchanger, we can check and you can see in fact that the tubes up here are filling with water, just like they should be. We hook up the MSR to the exchanger and this is where the knack will enter the heat exchanger. 
run its way through, and then we'll also set up a reservoir here to hold the cooled mag. Also, you can reuse this stuff as well. Okay, next, we make a fluid duct system that will take out all the steam and move it out of the exchange. Now, of course, you're probably already thinking, where's the steam gonna be headed? It's time for the turbine. The main component of the turbine is HSLA alloy, which can be made out of iron and a little bit of carbon manganese. It is a little bit complex, but one pile of the blend can make 16 HSLA ingots. So it's not a nightmare. And there's still hope that we can get this whole thing done by day 100. We start to smelt up some manganese dioxide, which gets us an ingot. We can then run that through the furnace again to get a manganese ingot. Crush down the manganese in a pulverizer, then combine it with some graphite. So again, it's not too hard. We then throw this in an alloy furnace with all of our iron, and soon we get our very first HSLA. Then combine that with just a few advanced panels, and we get our turbine controller. Once again, we need to combine the HLSA with steel to start to get the frame and the outer shell made. Of course, I'm gonna make the outer shell transparent so you can all see the turbine spinning at the end. And we are running a little bit low on iron, as I had predicted, but don't worry, that won't be a total deal breaker. Let's get the framework for this turbine all set up. So now, say it with me, what's our design? You guessed it, a three by three by five pattern. And we keep on working with the iron we have, making more and more turbine shell and frame blocks. But as the days tick by, we get closer and closer to day 100. And I start to realize something. This playthrough of 100 days on Minecraft has been one of my favorite. And by the time the MSR turbine system is all complete, I'm really not gonna get too much use from it. Now I could easily see myself doing 200 days in this bunker. And if you'd be a fan of that too, then please let me know. Join my Discord and yell at me all day or just throw a comment on this video. I know 200 days doesn't get too many views, but this one right here, it would be pretty fun. Okay, before we seal up the whole turbine, let's start the central rotor. It must be set on a rotor bearing. Next, we get the extreme alloy to make some of our blades. We will be making 12 extreme alloy blades, and we'll also be making a set of four stationary blades. I'm gonna be 100% honest with you guys, I would really like to give a better guide on how to set up this turbine, but I just looked up a tutorial on how to make this turbine, so I don't really know why we're using the blades that we are, but at the end of the day, it does work. After getting most of the blades in place, we can move on to finishing the body, which again, will take us a bit more iron. Then, the last step, we get started on making our dynamo coils, which work kind of like the coolers in a fission reactor, in that you have to make sure that all the needs of each dynamo is being met. For example, the magnesium coil must touch a rotor bearing. That's easy, so it's gonna be the starter in any turbine, but it does make the least RF. Silver is the best, then gold, then beryllium. But you can't just go throwing a bunch of silver because it has the hardest needs to be met. Then our beryllium coil must be touching a working magnesium, so that's gonna go next. Then gold must be touching a working beryllium. Then silver, which is the most annoying one of all, it must be touching a gold and magnesium. We can do this the exact same setup on both sides of the turbine and harvest RF from both sides. But we must leave at least one spot on both sides to place the turbine inlet and on the opposite side for the turbine outlet. The inlet brings the steam from the heat exchanger and the outlet will vent out the exhaust steam. We have to do a bit more mining so that everything is ready by day 100. And it should only take about 10 minutes of mining, but I got stuck under this weird, huge plate of obsidian. I was stuck down here for like a whole day before I found a way out. But we do get home and it's just in time because we need to finish the turbine. I gotta be honest, seeing this whole thing finished, it makes it all worth it. This is sick. After 100 days of some of the toughest engineering and survival I've ever done, I'm pretty proud to see this whole MSR heat exchanger turbine set up. With this, I'll be able to keep this vault running for the next 100 years or more. But there's only gonna be two days left of my time down here. On top 
of the big cost for components and the complexity of setting up the MSR system, it also has a pretty in-depth fuel production process. We don't have enough time to get both the molten salt fuels and the eutetic knack before day 100. Trust me, I tried. And I got pretty close, but I couldn't quite get it done. So, if you want to see this huge thing come to life, you'll just have to check out my 200 days as a nuclear engineer. Until then, keep surviving. Nah, I'll go into creative and I'll start it up for you guys. I couldn't tease you like that. Thank you guys so much for watching, and liking, and subscribing, and showing all of the love in the comments like you do. From the captain to his crew, peace out.